just share my screen to give you a little bit of background as to who we are and where we are. So the CMC SIG webinar this morning is coming from you courtesy of the CMC SIG, which is part of Eurocall. So you can see a little bit of information there about who we are in Eurocall, and you can see as well our um, social media and our, the name of our president, Miriam Hauk, and uh, our secretary, Tony Patton. You can Google Eurocall to find our website and find out more information about us. A little bit about what we do. Well, we are passionate, obviously, about the use of technology for uh, language learning and teaching. And our aim really is to bring together researchers, practitioners and developers um, so we can share uh, best practice and find out what's going on in the community. There's a little bit of information there as well for how you can join. And I do hope that's something you might uh, take up in order to become part of our wider community. So I'm going to, I, my name's Theresa McKinnon. I'm um, on the Eurocall exec, but I'm going to pass it over now to um, Salvador, who is leading the SIG and is going to lead today's events. So thank you, Salvador. Okay, hello, good morning, everyone. Good evening. Uh, I'll be very quick. Uh, my name is uh, Salvador Montaner. I am chairing the CMC SIG, as Teresa has said. And basically, uh, in today's webinar, uh, I would like you to hear three speakers, three prestigious speakers, who are going to talk about uh, the collaboration in foreign language learning. So in the first uh, place, I will uh, ask, please, uh, Chiara to begin your presentation. After Chiara, Marco will talk about uh, his proposal and we will finish with Amira's presentation. So Chiara, whenever you want, could you begin, please? Remember to introduce yourself and share your screen. Thank you, Tiara. Sure. Hi, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're joining us from. So my name is Cara Wiggum. I work in computer-assisted language learning in a school of education in Clermont-Ferrand in France. And today I'm going to talk a little bit about data management and particularly when we're looking at researching virtual exchange, the challenges that data management uh, can offer to us that we have to overcome. And I'll be using as a case study uh, a French project that I've been leading for the past year and a half, um, which is called Revel, which is interested in English language teaching through technology um, and through virtual exchange with primary school teachers. So um, in terms of research data, uh, we often look at the data lifestyle where when we have a research project, we start planning the project, then we get all excited because it's time to collect data, which I think is probably the most exciting part of a research project. Um, and in our case, we've been going into primary school classrooms and filming primary school classrooms and their interactions with other classrooms. Um, Often then in terms of research, we look at data analysis and the outcome uh, are publications and research journals such as Recall, which is the journal that's linked to the Euracall Association. And in this data lifestyle, data is really a means to an end. So we use data to analyze it, um, to publish it, to show our findings, but really the data itself isn't a very important byproduct uh, it's more a byproduct. It's not really a very important central part of the outcomes of the research. So um, Vines and Al in 2014 estimated that there was 17% loss every year of data that wasn't shared in some way. So if we just keep research data on our own local hard drives or on our local computers, that's slowly year by year, we'll lose data making the analysis and understanding the analysis later on more difficult. Um, so what do we mean by data loss? We mean, for example, when we're looking at studying virtual exchange, 
there's a lot of primary data that would be collected when we're conducting a research study. So this might be questionnaire data, videos of the interactions between learners. It could be interview data. Um, we might also collect information about the pedagogical activities or the learning design, or even information about the platform on which the virtual exchange is conducted. Um, obviously, if we're using Teams um, today in 2022, it's not going to have the same functionalities as data that was collected perhaps on Skype um, in 2013. However, a lot of this data is invisible um, because as we start to analyze the data, we'll first of all compile it and transform it, take it out of the platforms in which we studied it, um, and then we'll select different parts of the data, different sequences, uh, that we want to focus upon in terms of our own particular research question, and we'll analyze this part of the data. So in terms of data, what's often visible is really only the data illustrations that are in publication supports. So for example, if you took the recall journal or the ALSIC journal or language learning and technology, you might have captures of the data that are shown through graphs or illustrations or transcriptions of moments of interaction. Um, the learning design of virtual exchanges in research papers is often reduced simply to the context in the methodology section, so it doesn't represent more than 500 words. Um, and often we don't really know much about the platform where the virtual exchanges were conducted. It might be mentioned in name, Skype or Teams or BBB, or it might just be reduced to a generic name like a video conferencing platform. But that doesn't really tell us much about what version of the platform we were using for our exchanges, um, what functionalities were available at that moment uh, when the exchange was conducted. So you can see from a mass of data that we collect when we're doing research on virtual exchange that a lot of it becomes invisible and a lot of it is lost during the analysis and publication process. And what is remains as visible is just a very, very, very small amount which is directly related to one particular research question. So it's a lot of effort and uh, a lot of data collection really that gets reduced to not much. Um, in the French research context, where myself and Marco will be speaking from, in 2016, there was a law called the Digital Republic Law, which was published. And this asked all researchers who had publicly funded um, research data um, they asked researchers to publish it as open access. So it became open access became a principle for all administrative data. In the open science plan that was published in 2018, again, publicly funded research projects were asked to publish the data that was collected if public money was being used to collect that data. This meant uh, scientific publications, so our articles, any books we publish, uh, we're invited to publish them as open access so everybody can access them. But also it meant compulsory open access diffusion of research data. And uh, I've been involved in this type of work for quite a while. Um, I've been looking at how can, from the massive data we collect in the research project, how can we structure data um, so I worked on something called learning and teaching corpora, which was an idea of how to structure data so that we could share it with other researchers who are interested in the topic so that they could perform either a secondary analysis uh, on the same data, looking at it from a different uh, research viewpoint or a different research question, um, or they could um, analyze, reanalyze the data about the same research question and check findings. Um, as part of this French initiative to try to have publicly funded research projects move towards open access, um, a site uh, called Opidor was made available to researchers working in France and beyond. And this is a data management planning site. So now when we're um, planning a research project, we're asked to think about what are we going to do with the data? How are we going to treat it? How are we going to stock it? How are we going to make it open access and available to other researchers or practitioners or even developers? Um, um, and we're asked to produce a research data management plan, which really gets us thinking about what are we going to do with the data throughout the project? And so today I'm going to talk a little bit about the data management plan that's behind the Ravel research project. Um, 
when we're thinking about data management plans, uh, we often think about the digital data lifestyle. Um, so at the start, I showed the, the data lifestyle, uh, which often focused on publication. But now that we're using a lot of digital data and that we're being pushed towards open access, um, it's more a circular lifestyle. So we have project and data planning and management. Then we think about data collection, analyzing the data, sharing um, and publishing the data, which is a new point. Um, then thinking about how to preserve data, how to back it up, how to be able to make sure that in five years time, other researchers could still access it. Thinking about data reuse, and perhaps when we're now planning research projects, we're also thinking about, well, maybe we don't need to start by collecting our own data. Maybe we can use other people's data and then add to that, and that would be data reuse. Um, so in terms of this digital data lifestyle, in the first step in the project and data management planning, we're thinking about creating the research protocol, um, defining a data management plan using sites such as OpenDoor, um, elaborating consent forms and ethical procedures um, to make sure that all participants agree that their data could be included um, in publication, and especially if it's going to be open access, that they're okay with that. And for some of us, um, getting ethical clearance from universities, ethics committees, or other um, institutions. In terms of data analysis, uh, sorry, data collection, so here we're talking about collecting the data, how we're going to create it, how we're going to capture it, how we're going to describe it through metadata. So it's very important if we want to reuse the data later that other researchers will be able to understand under what conditions was the data, data collected. Was it in a first school? Was it in the part of the final task of the virtual exchange? What language was being used? Uh, what part of the teaching scenario was being used, who were the participants, who were the teachers. And so all of that would be described using metadata. Um, then we have the data analysis stage, which I think most people will be familiar with. And then um, publication and data sharing. So here we're thinking about anonymizing the data so that we could share it with other people. Also defining author rights. So just like a research publication would have a citation, here thinking about who are the authors of this data. Um, if we want to reuse it later, how can we cite the data? Thinking about what kind of publication license are we going to publish it under so that it can be shared. Um, checking that our met metadata perhaps fits with standards. Thinking also about how is the data going to be backed up? And where are we going to share it? How are we going to share it? Who are we going to be able to share it with? Data preservation is looking at if we want to share data with other people, what's the best format to do it in? It's really annoying when somebody sends you even a document and, oh, it's using Apple, but we're working on Windows and we can't open it. So the same thing happens with data. If we're sharing video interaction data or questionnaire data, quite often it's um, locked into the software in which it was captured. And so how are we going to take it out of that software into a format where everybody should be able to read it or at least read it with open access tools? Also thinking about how is the data gonna be backed up to make sure that we don't lose it. And then thinking about once we've shared the data with the research and teaching community, um, how can we reuse it? Um, are we able to reuse it for secondary analysis, follow? follow-up research, new research, or even evaluating the initial research. So today I'm going to focus really on the very first stage of this cycle, the project and data management planning stage. Oh, sorry, wrong way. So the case study I'm going to talk about is a French project called RAVEL, which stands for Resources for Learning and Teaching Languages in Virtual Classrooms. It's a government funded digital thematic group, and it's really a collaboration between the local education authority um, through local primary school teachers and researchers who are in language and educational sciences. The project has got four overarching global aims. Um, first of all, to compile a systematic overview of research that relates to digital technologies in primary school education. Um, with regards to language learning, foreign language learning, and specifically English. Um, then to look at different research contributions on the topic with feedback from practitioners, teachers, 
um, educators and also teaching inspectors um, who are part of the French educational system. The heart of the project is really about creating and testing virtual exchange learning scenarios that would incorporate the use of digital technologies. Um, so working with the teachers um, and collaborating with them to introduce what is virtual exchange, introduce technology, enhance language learning, um, look at what's possible with uh, beginner learners in primary schools and create a scenario, um, then test the scenario. Um, we're evaluating the teaching scenarios and then we're going to disseminate um, both the teaching scenarios so that other primary school teachers could use them with their classes but also the research data as open access resources. So here in terms of the research designed to create and test the learning scenarios, um, we've had several different research polls. The first was a review of practices. So we sent a questionnaire and received 254 responses from primary school teachers asking them about what are their beliefs about language learning and teaching in primary school contexts and what are their classroom practices? What do they do? Because primary school teachers in France aren't specifically trained as language teachers. So we needed to understand better what type of activities do they do? What type of beliefs do they have about the language and teaching context in which they're working? We also performed a systematic literature review. Um, so we looked at research papers uh, that were interested in technology enhanced language learning and oral interaction skills in the primary sector. Uh, we found 626 papers, which were then reduced to 23 to conduct this research. And then using uh, the results of the research and the results of the teachers review of practices, uh, we tried to take those results and uh, use those results to help us better co-concept, co-design the scenarios. So we had three working groups that worked on three different um, technology enhanced uh, language learning teaching scenarios. And two of those looked at telecollaboration or virtual exchange. So there's um, a virtual exchange between two French primary schools and another virtual exchange between France and Spain. Um, there were three working groups, so three teaching scenarios, two on virtual exchange, and then they were tested by more classrooms. So there are actually nine classes who were involved in testing these two scenarios, um, the two virtual exchange scenarios. Um, and when we were testing the scenarios, we had a pre-questionnaire for the learners and for the teachers about uh, their language learning and teaching habits. Uh, we collected interaction data, so both um, screen captures from the exchanges that were happening between the two classrooms, but also going into the classrooms physically ourselves um, and using video recording and audio recording data to better understand not just what was happening as mediated through the screen during the virtual exchanges, but what else was happening in the, in the physical classroom as the exchanges took place. Uh, we conducted learner focus groups and we will be collecting the task, the final task productions in a few weeks time. And this interaction data is going to be analyzed uh, with regards to three themes, learning design, multimodal online communication, and also an ecological evaluation of the overall collaboration between teachers and researchers in the project. In terms of the data that we want to publish as open data for other people to use, uh, we want to publish our research tools. Um, so our questionnaires, our uh, questionnaires about teaching practices, our uh, questionnaires before the virtual exchanges so that other people could reuse those questionnaires if they were pertinent. We want to publish the formalized learning scenarios so they could be adopted by other classroom teachers and also the study data that could be reused by researchers who weren't involved in the initial project. So we started in our working group um, by having a meeting that we um, based on a series of questions that are published with a colleague, Solange Arana in 2020. And some of the questions that we asked ourselves were as follows. Uh, what data would be collected during the telecollaboration project? What policies would apply to that data? Who would be responsible for the data? Uh, what consent procedures were, um, Written consent procedures were in place in France and in Spain for collecting data. Where would we store the data? 
How would we share the data? Um, how would we ensure that other people could understand the data, even if they weren't involved in the virtual exchange? Could we put into place standardized formatting procedures? If there was data in multiple locations, how would we track different versions um, of the data? How would we document how we collected the data? Would we use different standards? How could the data be labeled, cataloged, annotated? Um, if different institutions were saving data and they were in different formats, how could we merge those? So if we had a view of the classroom from one side in Spain and one side in France, how could we merge those videos? And how might we make the data available to future users? How would we preserve personal data for use in the future? So we had a first meeting with the project team to brainstorm these questions. Then we used a collaborative document that I've given you a screenshot of, in which we listed the different data types that would be involved in the research practice, in the research project, sorry. Uh, who were the people who would be involved? What modalities, what different types of formats we were going to be using? Would it be diffused, yes or no, as open access? And then any suggestions or remarks we had. And then two researchers who were involved in the project, Christine Rodriguez Blanchard and myself, uh, drafted the first version of the data management plan. So the data management plan, we looked at data description, how will the data be collected, produced, uh, how would any existing data be reused? So here we talked about the different types of data that we would collect. Um, the data plan asked us what kind of formats or volumes would be collected. So our questionnaires were using line survey, we had audio recordings in MP3, and we tried to give a, an idea of the number each time. Um, during the second stage, what was quite difficult was looking at the consent procedures uh, for getting this type of interaction data, because we needed both uh, consent from parents, from the learners themselves, despite them being young, and uh, with virtual exchange, the same consent form being filled in by the learners in Spain and the learners in France. Um, we also, in the data management plan, talked about what metadata and documentation would accompany the data. Um, so we decided that we would publish specifically an article about the data collection methodology that would be deposited in an open archive, that all the questionnaires, interview guides, that we'd deposit templates so they could be reused, that we would have a research protocol for each class where the learning scenario was um, taking place that would be formalized, and that we'd also produce a transcription and annotation guide um, to diffuse with the data. So really here, the key was the formalization of a research protocol and saying what we we're going to do at each stage. In terms of data quality control measures, um, our questionnaires were pre-tested. Any data that is not audible is going to be removed. That's actually the process we're at at the moment. And we really thought carefully about how to name different versions of the data. So the anonymized version, the non-anonymized version, the annotated version of the data, um, especially because the same scenario was used in different schools. And so it was, we couldn't just call them questionnaire learners um, because we had learners in different learning scenarios. Um, we thought about how would the data and metadata be stored and backed up. Um, so in fact, it's being stored on a university drive because it's protected by password with a backup on an external hard drive, which is kept in a locked safe in our research lab. Um, only the non-anonymized data is available only to project members. Um, in terms of data anonymization, we use pseudonyms and blurring of children's faces. Um, and the file, which links the real names with the pseudonyms, is only available to the project coordinators and the postdoc who's working on the project. Um, the problem we encountered here was that our personal space on the university drive wasn't big enough, and so we had to negotiate with the university and institutionalized space in order to save the data. Um, in terms of how data security and protection were taken care of, um, we can only access the data using our university computers, not personal computers, through the university drive. It's, present, it's protected by password. Um, here we had a, a very difficult time because, in fact, the postdoc works part-time at another university, and we ended up having to loan her one of our university computers um, in order that she'd be able to access our drive. We also had one researcher who changed jobs during the project, who changed the institution, um, which meant that we had to negotiate all sorts of access rights for her. 
So that's really something to think about is if the data is being stored somewhere, even if the project team changes, how are they going to have access to it? Um, in terms of legal and ethical requirements, um, we had to think carefully about personal data. Our university ethics committee actually for the initial questionnaire on teaching practices did not allow us to um, get any information about the teachers' names or email addresses. And this is really frustrating because it means that the teachers who are now testing the learning scenarios, we can't actually cross-reference any of that data with the initial questionnaire. And so we've had to redo a second questionnaire that's just for the teachers who are taking part in the data collection. Um, I would say another difficulty we had in this area was also the tone of the consent forms for the parents with the Spanish translation, but it was finding the right tone so that parents wouldn't be scared that their young children were being involved in a research project and knew exactly what we we're going to do with the data and what we were putting into place to make sure it was safe. Um, our studies had to go through the University Ethics Committee, as I said, parents were given the choice of blurring faces or not. Um, we followed French National Research Council recommendations for data anonymization, and the participants can withdraw from the study at any time. And so, therefore, parents kept a copy of the signed consent form, and we also gave a copy to the schools. Um, we had to state how long we would uh, keep the data, so we decided on 10 years. We have no idea whether that's a long enough amount of time or not. Um, once the data, the raw data is um, going to be conserved, but once it's been treated and anonymized, we're going to publish the data on the Autolong repository, which is an open access data repository, which Marco, I think, will talk a little bit more about. Um, we had to state how uh, the data that would be selected to go onto Autolong would be selected. And so we said that it would be selected depending on our three research questions. So any data that's not related to our research questions won't end up as open access data. And we also had to think about the formats in which we would uh, share our data so that we'd use methods and software tools where everybody could have access. So for example, um, Lime Survey is a questionnaire tool um, which you have to pay for, which our university pays for. And so all the data was taken out of that and put into an open access format. So it could be open um, either with Excel or with the open office software. Um, we also asked ourselves who would be responsible for the data management. Um, so it came down to the project coordinators and the research engineer. And we said we would look at the research um, data management plan on a yearly basis and update it at different stages. I don't know if Marco will touch on this, but in France, one of the things we're trying to do is to make sure that data is fair, so findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And we actually had to state in the data management plan how, uh, what human resources would be used to ensure that our data would be fair. So here we've employed a postdoc uh, on the project with a lot of tasks related to data management in order to ensure that the metadata um, is completed in order to ensure that uh, the data is anonymized, which takes a long amount of time. So to finish, um, what I've learned from this process, I'd say that the data collection phase, the idea of formalizing it through a data management plan was really, really, really useful. It's not something that I'd done before, um, but in fact, we found in the, within the project that we're continuously going back to this document and it really is there to guide us when we've forgotten something or also to help us keep our end goals in mind. Um, so there are, we've avoided a lot of back and forths about are we keeping this data? Are we collecting this data? What are we doing with this? Because we say, oh, let's look at what we said in the initial project planning phases. Um, we had to negotiate a lot of needs in terms of data storage. So if you're looking at research projects, uh, think about that more than we did ahead of time. Um, one thing I thought was going to be an issue was the fact we we're working with young learners, but at the moment we haven't had any constraints or obstacles regarding this point. And I think that was probably because we got the classroom teachers involved from the onset um, in writing the consent forms with us. And therefore they were very used to writing letters to parents and notes to parents. So I think we really got the right tone um, to work with the children and the, the children's parents. Um, I'd say that we're very lucky in France because there's a lot of infrastructures to help us with data management. So in OPDO, where we do the data management plan, it guides you through step by step. 
We have the Autolong repository where we're going to end up putting our data, which is available to us. We have uh, HAL, which is an open access repository for scientific articles. So really on a national level, we have quite a good infrastructure to help us. Um, we've had less support for sharing the learning scenarios with the, the future teaching population. We want to share them both with other teachers who might like to use them, but also with teacher trainers. And I feel like in France, um, open access learning scenarios um, aren't as well developed. Um, so we're now looking into open educational resources and what's available to us and how could we um, formalize the learning scenarios so that other people could use the teaching plans for their virtual exchanges. And I just wanted to finish by saying that the final version of the data management plan will be published at the end of the project. So even the data management plan itself is an outcome of the project, um, which might help guide other people when writing such documents. So thanks very much. This is me sharing my experience. I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you very much, Tiara, for your for your speaking. Now, Marco, we would like you to, to hear your proposal. Uh, Marco, please, could you try to do between 10 and 15 minutes? No, try not to do more than 15, please, because sure. maybe people will want to ask questions later. Sure. Uh, and okay. uh, if I'm going a little bit uh, over my 15 minutes, please just... Uh, Take the floor and, and stop me. Okay, I will, uh, I will tell you in the in the in the chat just in case. Okay. 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 Thank you. Uh, can you see my screen? Yep. Yes. Perfectly. Okay. Perfect. So, um, well, thank you very much for 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 the invitation. Uh, when we started to uh, to discuss about this webinar, uh, I think it was during the. Uh, Paris online Eurocall conference. Um, we we had this idea of of trying to share uh, some uh, some experiences about how to collect data in CMC and telecollaboration and virtual exchange. And uh, uh, I just wanted to say a couple of things before uh, starting to to talk. The first one is that I'm not an expert on uh, data management, uh, corpus building, and so on. I think here uh, Cara is the expert. So if you have theoretical questions, <laughs> it should be the, the those should be asked to, uh, to her or, or other people I, I possibly don't know in, uh, in the audience. And uh, the second thing is that, uh, as you can see here, uh, uh, well, I'm the one speaking, uh, but uh, this is a collective, a collective work. And uh, especially when we are, uh, well, of course, when we are dealing with telecollaboration, you have at least two people in team. But uh, if you are in a research project, usually you have uh, uh, quite a, a, a numerous te team with, uh, with you. So I'm also talking, uh, thanks to the work of, of other colleagues I will mention in, uh, in my speech. So, um, I'm sharing the, the experience of a, a project called uh, Vibvisio, uh, which I will present. Uh, first of all, I will uh, start with the state of the art and the research questions of this project. And then I will talk about uh, data collection procedures for this project. And then uh, from data collection on how we built a corpus and how we are sharing this, uh, uh, this corpus. Uh, the project was written in 2017, so uh, the, the gaps that we identified back then uh, are uh, possibly different uh, five years later than it is now. But here is what we found. First of all, in 2017, we, we saw that the uh, video conference was becoming more and more um, uh, used in, uh, in virtual exchange and telecollaboration. Uh, as it was mentioned, for instance, by Rob O'Dowd in, uh, in a paper of uh, 2016. And of course, uh, after the pandemic, you, you, you all know that video conference was one of the main tools to uh, keep the pedagogical continuity. The second thing that we uh, noted was that uh, uh, there are different sets of uh, uh, competencies to teach online, to tutor online for a foreign language uh, education. And uh, the question was, which are uh, specifically for foreign language teaching through video conference? And uh, uh, for this, we started, we, we built on, uh, uh, on different researches, uh, on different studies. Uh, mainly uh, the ones in the, at the Open University in the UK and the ones that were uh, run in uh, uh, the University of Lyon in, uh, in France. 
And we, we took the, the concept of techno-pedagogic competence as it is defined by uh, Gishon and, uh, and Cohen, for instance. Then we also saw that uh, there are there were and there still are, I think, uh, different ways to observe the development of technopedagogic competence. The uh, one of the, the, the gaps, uh, well, one of the limits is that usually uh, studies focus on just one uh, virtual exchange model. So the idea is to, uh, in this project, to, to build a comparative approach to uh, compare different models. Uh, for us, it is uh, uh, Teletandem, which probably you are familiar with. And the other one is what in France is called Le Français en Première Ligne, which is basically having a future teacher uh, elaborate tasks that he or she will deliver to actual learners in another country. The second thing was uh, about the observations uh, of the competence that uh, were usually at a given moment, uh, especially at the end of, uh, of a virtual exchange. And uh, there are uh, very few um, studies or research projects that look at how uh, these competencies developed throughout the virtual exchange. So uh, that, was, that was one other uh, gap that we uh, intended to um, to target. And uh, the third one was that the observation of technopedagogic strategies uh, was usually done through, um, well, at least you could observe what happens online during video conference, but it is difficult to get the intentions of the teacher during this, uh, this exchange. And when the intentions are uh, researched, usually, usually it is through um, questioners after the exchange or through stimulated recalls or interviews. So it is, you, it is always uh, after the interaction and not during the interaction itself. And uh, uh, so we, we observed a lack of, of observation of the cognition in action. And that is, one, is the third uh, gap that we, uh, we aimed. So our research questions were, first of all, which technopedagogic competencies are developed in virtual exchange through video conference? And, uh, um, and the second question is that, as you probably uh, saw during the, the pandemic, when you start to have uh, video conferences as a teacher or, or as a learner, you, I would say, naturally uh, develop some types of competencies. And uh, the question is then, which are developed without any formal training and which ones need a formal training to be developed and that is uh, why a comparative approach is uh, uh, is useful so to answer those questions uh, we uh, developed this comparative approach with uh, uh, different contexts and partners um, the uh, Divav Visio project is, uh, is funded by the uh, Agence Nationale de la Recherche with a local team at the Laboratoire Parole et Langage uh, composed of uh, uh, research engineers, uh, uh, researchers, and uh, informaticians. And then we set up four virtual exchanges for telecollaborations with uh, uh, different partners. So we had two teletandem settings, one for French, English, with Arizona State University and ex Marseille University, one for French, Chinese, with uh, uh, ex Marseille University and Shenzhen uh, Foreign Language, the Shenzhen Foreign Language School. And then two others based on the uh, Francais en Première Ligne, so a tutoring um, virtual exchange, one between future teachers of French in ex Marseille and actual learners at the uh, University uh, of California, Berkeley. And the other one between future teachers of Chinese as a foreign language at the Hong Kong Polytechnic University and learners of Chinese here in, uh, in Aix en Provence. So we had these, uh, uh, these groups, if you want. And the idea is that in tandem, in teletandem, you don't have formal training to develop techno-pedagogic competencies, at least not in these uh, two uh, virtual exchanges. So the development that we can observe is only due to the practice and the reflection of, uh, of the students themselves. On the contrary, in the tutor setting, uh, there is a formal training for the future teachers uh, and uh, uh, what is developed, we think, well, we hope, uh, it will be uh, more developed than what is developed in, uh, in Teletandem. 
So by comparing what is developed in Teletandem and in the tutor setting, we will be able to identify which uh, strategies or competencies need uh, a formal training. So big uh, part of, uh, of the data collection was the ethical procedures. When you are in a computer mediated communication, you usually have at least two different countries. So two legal uh, frameworks to, to deal with. And uh, uh, at least for us, it was the point uh, of starting was uh, in France, um, the, the, the the, how the legislation evolved with uh, the RGPD. GDPR, sorry, um, legislation in, in Europe. So we, at, uh, in, in 2018, we didn't have to produce a data management plan after six months uh, uh, in the project. Uh, what we had to do was to uh, fill in this, uh, uh, this form of, uh, uh, to register at the, uh, with the uh, CNRS. So uh, this is a form uh, more or less uh, touching on the same parts that Cara uh, mentioned just before. So we had to, explain which kinds of data were uh, collected, how would they be treated, anonymized and uh, analyzed, and then how these were, the, the, the data would be stored and uh, uh, how it could be uh, possible to access the data by the researchers, but also by the subjects is if after, I don't know, four years they decide they, they don't want to be uh, in the data in the data sets uh, anymore. So we filled this uh, and uh, then we had uh, uh, forms with uh, enlightened consent with each one of the participants in France. I had uh, one and one of my colleagues, we had to spend uh, uh, 20 to 30 minutes with each one of them explaining everything was, that was uh, uh, in, uh, in the document. And then they decided to accept or not different uh, types of, uh, of consent and possibly add some of them in, uh, at the end. In the USA, uh, we had to, uh, well, for instance, with uh, the Arizona State University, we, uh, at first, uh, they asked uh, us to, uh, to uh, attend a course that they had for uh, IRB. Uh, and this course was, uh, well, they, they wanted to charge us for like uh, for, uh, $400, I think it was more or less. So we started to negotiate that we already had uh, a training in, in this and we, uh, in the end, uh, especially thanks to uh, the, the help by uh, Brian, uh, Brian Smith, uh, we, they, they could accept our uh, formula in, uh, in the French version, which was translated and then uh, they obtained this uh, IRM, IRB sorry, uh, number. And uh, one thing that is to be taken into account there is that we filed the, the form in 2018, but the, uh, the, 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 uh, the agreement was signed in uh, 2020, so two years after we collected the, the data. If the form wasn't uh, accepted, we, had, we just had to, to delete all the data on the work that we, we, had, we, we did. And uh, actually, the most efficient way to uh, for, for the data, uh, the, the ethical parts, was in uh, Hong Kong. They, uh, well, the colleagues in uh, in Hong Kong and mainland China, they just filed a demand, and uh, uh, after I think it was three months, they had the, the number of uh, of acceptance. So we had really to to deal with all the different legislations and uh, with different uh, with different times. For the data collection, I see I have already 11 minutes, so uh, I will probably skip this, but uh, one of the ideas was to just have one channel per speaker. So we, uh, we designed a way to, uh, to uh, record uh, only one voice for one channel using two, uh, two laptops and uh, splitting the, uh, the audio uh, streams to, uh, to be recorded separately. For the, uh, uh, the study of the cognition, we, uh, during the interaction, we, we, had, uh, uh, we, we, saw, we used uh, an eye tracking device. So this is something that will, uh, will uh, record where you are looking on the screen uh, at each, each uh, given moment. Uh, for us, it was a Toby uh, bar, which was just uh, um, uh, below the, the screen, and this was uh, what the uh, the the uh, the 
the room looked like for, uh, for recording data. So as you can see, there is one laptop here, another uh, computer uh, at the other end to, uh, to, uh, for, for this uh, splitting the audio streams. And then this laptop here was uh, connected to the bar, the eye tracking bar and a screen and uh, a separate mouse and, uh, and keyboard. And we also had uh, an external camera to see uh, what was the use of the space uh, for the learners in, uh, in France, at least. So we collected those kinds of data, audio recordings, video recordings, eye tracking, and then we had to treat them to make them uh, uh, become a, a corpus. First, we used uh, uh, an open software developed here at the Laboratoire Paul et Langage, which is called SPAS. And this enabled us to find, to automatically uh, determine the uh, intern pose units, which means basically when you have someone speaking. And since we had uh, one channel for each interlocutor, this automatically created the labels that were then to be filled manually for, for the transcription. And this, uh, uh, this software is also in, uh, interesting for, uh, for data analysis, for instance, for lexical alignment. Uh, so this is what uh, it looks like. The, uh, one of the ideas is also to have an alignment between the sounds and then have uh, uh, the, uh, um, the transcription, which is manual. But then all the other levels are uh, generated uh, automatically. For the eye tracking, uh, what was difficult was to uh, determine the areas of interest, that is, uh, uh, which part of the screen corresponded, for instance, to the face of the interlocutor, because in video conference, you can move around and you can have uh, the screen arranged in, uh, in different uh, uh, ways. So we, what we had to do that is that we used uh, um, a face recognition uh, open software, which identifies the, the surface of the faces. And then we could cross uh, with uh, the eye tracking to, be, to automatically know when uh, there was, uh, uh, when an interlocutor was looking at the, uh, the, uh, the interlocutor's face. And then we exported everything within Elan. Uh, with uh, automatic scripts. For instance, here you have the, uh, the number of milliseconds for each uh, fixation, uh, 633, for instance, in the middle. Uh, to, and uh, we, we put everything within Elan to have uh, the, uh, the transcription, the uh, automatic analysis, and then to uh, run our own uh, analysis. And then to, uh, to end uh, for the sharing, so we had uh, in total 86 uh, recorded sessions of about uh, one hour each. And we uh, now have 37 transcribed uh, sessions for uh, the different uh, before data sets. And we, uh, we started to put everything in uh, Ortolang, which is this uh, sharing repository, um, which is completely free by the way, and uh, with great, uh, well, support, let's say, to, to guide the researchers to, uh, to share their uh, the data. So this is what it looks like. And this is what looks, uh, uh, if, you, if you look for uh, the VAB Visio project within it, this is the page that you will find. And uh, there you will have uh, an example and uh, uh, you can ask for, for permission to get and to uh, see the, the different data that we, we had. Um, so the uh, we we also had to decide uh, the license to uh, to publish the data, and then we we have uh, uh, well the contents, but also the members of the project, the uh, metadata, as we as Carl said uh, just before, to to uh, help understand uh, where the the data uh, comes from, and uh, well other different things. So I think that's it. Sorry, I was two minutes too long, but. Uh, Thank you very much for your attention, and uh, I will leave the floor to uh, to Amira. Okay, it was it was perfect. Thank you very much, Marco. Uh, Amira, could you could you begin whenever you can, please? Try to, if, if possible, between ten and fifteen minutes. Okay. Yes, I think it is very short, so I'm not going to repeat what they have said. Thank you, Marco and uh, Cara, for your presentations. 
Mine is, is about researching online intercultural or language exchanges, practical steps and tips from the field. So what I'm going to share with you is my PhD project, how I proceeded with it, proceeded with it and how I gathered my data and how I analyzed it. So I'm Amira Ben Abdelkader from uh, the University of Monterey Constantine. The project I'm, I'm presenting today, I did it at the University of Southampton. Uh, so all the ethical procedures and stuff were according to the uh, regulations of the University of Southampton in the UK. So at first I will talk about my online intercultural uh, exchange, my aims, sample and process. And then I will give um, very briefly some tips on uh, that I learned myself during that process on how to organize an uh, OIE, uh, the, the pre-stage and then during and then the post-stage and then collecting data from the OII and organizing and, and analyzing it. So at first, my online intercultural uh, exchange, like uh, Kara said, I used Skype. At that time, Teams was not that popular and Teams was not that uh, developed. So Skype was easier, was free, and was at the time the uh, software that allows to gather three people at the same time with no time limit. Uh, so the two, the two people were me and the pair of participants. All right, so before I started, it was, I used the questionnaire to see uh, if the participants or the sample that I targeted are really fit for my research. So I did that questionnaire and then that questionnaire helped me to, um, to organize them into pairs. And then during, as I said, I used Skype and to record my screen, I used Panopto. It was the software um, available and offered by the University of Southampton. It was very secure and uh, it, 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 it's, it was the only one that protects the data that I, that I um, record. And uh, also uh, was free. So the university bought the license and uh, I can come back to my recordings uh, the time I want. And uh, as well, it allows to record the whole screen and the, the time is not limited. Uh, so during the recording, I made sure I um, mute myself and uh, not interrupt my participants. My role was only to introduce them uh, to the topic they are going to discuss, um, explain to them what they are going to do and that even though I gave them topics, they were free to talk about whatever thing if they ever feel stuck or um, uh, run out of ideas. At the end, um, I used the retrospective report like Marco highlighted. This is maybe a limitation in this uh, um, uh, exchange is that I couldn't uh, get their um, comments or feedback on the exchange during. And that's because they were just volunteers and I, I didn't want to exploit them any further. So I kept the uh, retrospective report uh, at, till the end. I wanted to do focus groups, but then they were super busy with their exams. So I couldn't do that. As for the top, the participants, they were from uh, four countries. So uh, my only uh, condition was that they, they are, L1, speak, L1 speakers of English, uh, L1 speakers of French and Algerian participants. So for the L1 speakers of English, I had uh, two from uh, the United, uh, well, three from the United Kingdom, one from France, one from Belgium and two Algerian participants. For the topics, um, the first session was like ice breaking, so I asked them to, to introduce themselves and as well to talk about how people that they know or in their countries or in their cultures introduce themselves to others, to foreigners, and when they meet people, how they react, uh, interact with them. So for each topic, uh, they need to, uh, to converse for one hour in English and then one hour in French. So basically uh, what was planned is to have two sessions a week. It means two hours a week, one hour in English and one hour in French. 
And then the second topic, family gathering, neighbors, the punctuality until the last one was celebration. So the topics were meant to cover some cultural, um, so th there were cultural related ones because I wanted that to show, I wanted them to show, uh, to describe their, their cultures and to negotiate their cultural practices and overcome any kind of stereotypes or misunderstandings they, 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 they come through. And at the same time, um, I wanted to see how uh, they, they also manage the whole conversation, the, the one hour conversation. So my aim, let's say I had two aims, a macro one, how they really um, manage the whole conversation, how they, how they deal with that one hour. And the second aim, it was very micro. I, I looked at the, their negotiation of meanings and uh, meaning making and um, like uh, introducing their cultures and practices. I also considered the nonverbal language in my analysis. So what I learned is certain aims and when planning for the uh, OIE, we need to know the duration, the number of sessions, activities and topics to be covered in each session. So my OIE was extracurricular. It means it wasn't part of their education. So they were doing it just something extra, an extra activity for them. Uh, the target population was, as I said, speak learners of English and French, learners slash speakers of English or French, then uh, checked the coherence between the aims and the sample. So what I wanted to see, I wanted to see them using two different languages. One is foreign, the other one is the L1 and vice versa, and how they were using it to talk about their cultures. Then I checked the coherence, as I said, between now and then choosing the platform, as I explained, Skype was the easiest uh, one to get to access for me and for my uh, participants. Uh, finding screen recording software, as I said, I opted for Panopto, it was the available one, approaching the sample and recruiting participants and explaining the tasks for participants. So for recruiting, I used um, adverts. Uh, the adverts, I wrote them in English, French, and in Arabic, just to make sure they are clear enough for everybody and that there, were, there couldn't be any misunderstanding of the, uh, of the um, of not the task, but of the inter exchange uh, in general. Then to explain the tasks, I used emails and at the beginning of each session, I explain everything in details. Right, to uh, schedule those uh, conversations, I used Doodle just to give them the freedom to find the appropriate times for each of them and then find the convenient one for the, each pair. During the OIE, as I said, I explained the task, uh, although I gave them the, um, the, the topics, the, but the topics, but they were not obliged to stick to them. So they might, so they used them mainly to start the conversation or as an, as a, as a, as a savior, whenever they are, they, they do not find any ideas uh, outside those topics. So they go back to the topic and discuss it further. So they were not really um, required to talk about the topic for one hour. And then make it as natural as possible. I didn't want to make any interference. This is why I was muting my, myself and turning on, off my camera. I didn't want them to see my reaction to what they were saying. And I didn't want them to see uh, or to um, to feel that I'm controlling them or I'm watching them uh, and so on. But they knew that I was there and I was recording them. Sometimes they forget. So when they finish the conversation, they text me, Amira, are you there? We are finished with the conversation. So I, I tried not to be there at all so that they, the conversation will be as natural as possible. 
while they were talking, I was observing and taking notes, uh, recording, of course, and also saving the notes and recordings each time they finish, uh, mentioning the date and the participants' pseudonyms. Uh, noting down the main features at the end. So at the end, they make a sort of a summary of how the conversation goes, what are the main features of that conversation. So this is uh, during the phase. At the end of the, uh, the, OA, uh, the OIE, I organized data into files. At, at the beginning, I used it by data set, but I, I, I then said, I shouldn't be influenced by the pairs, so it's better to organize them by case. It might be better for others to make, to organize them um, by data sets, but for me it was by case, I mean by pair. Uh, transcribing the conversations fully or partially, for me I needed to transcribe them fully because I was interested in each detail in each conversation and as well in the pattern of the conversation. Uh, I even took notes when, uh, when I was transcribing because I it was mainly the uh, preliminary phase of, of my analysis there. So I needed to note down what I see when transcribing. Um, I also note, noted down potential themes and codes and highlighted the chunks that sound relevant to my study aims. So this is what I did. It was, as I said, the preliminary analysis and at the same time, the transcription phase. So I was talking about the conversation pattern and how the participants managed the conversation. So what you see here, these are the topics they uh, talked about during the session. So this is only um, this is an example of the uh, first conversation of a pair in French. Uh, so the first conversation was about introducing uh, themselves, but they talked about playing using a music instrument, singing, a favorite author, favorite TV show, and because it is the fir their first conversation in French, so they needed to uh, explore more um, about each other's cultures, each other's hobbies, uh, preferences, and so on. So as you see here, I was also interested on, on, on how they managed and how they used those, um, those conversations in order to form a kind of small culture. And, uh, and this is why I used, um, I used two uh, kind of, um, frameworks to analyze my data. So first was the pattern, see, see how they managed, the opening, the ending, the topics they discussed, why they chose those topics to discuss and so on. And then the second one is how each pair um, has in a way invested in those conversations to form a, a culture that is specific to them only. And with the, um, so after four months of conversations, they managed to have some shared knowledge. So each in each conversation, they go back to the, that shared one and they discuss it further, ask more questions. So you feel that they are not only taking that exchange as something uh, for fun, but rather they are, they are considering it as a way to learn, to learn about uh, their peers' culture and also use the language. And at the same time, construct some shared space uh, between them and their pairs. So um, this is my uh, my presentation. I hope I, I didn't exceed the 15, maybe it's less, right? <laughs> anyway, here are well my- Well done, Amira. Today. Not 10. Well done, Amira. I have to say, Salvador, you have um, three presenters with hugely complex and a very detailed work to share with us in a very short space of time. So I've just put into the uh, into the chat um, mm -hmm. and I hope the presenters don't mind. I've put their um, Twitter profiles in there so that uh, if people want to uh, follow their work and get more detail, perhaps they can connect in that way because I know you've got to dash off to work very shortly. Salvador? 
Are you still with yes. us? Repeat again, please. Oh, I was. I was. Teresa, could you repeat again, please? No problem. I know you've got to rush off to work, so I just yes, wanted I to make sure that you're. Uh, I still have a few okay. minutes. Don't worry about that. Okay, uh, lovely. Okay, okay. I, I, I will have to leave by uh, in in eight minutes. Okay, to work. So, but don't worry about that. Okay, uh, maybe people would like to ask something. Any questions they would like to ask in the chat or just uh, use some minutes to ask Marco, Amira, or Chiara? I think there are already questions in the chat, so maybe. That's, that's true. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah. Uh, as, as you know, the, the chat is also very really useful for this. So. Thank you, Wafa, for sharing that feedback too. It's nice to mm -hmm. it's nice to have feedback from the audience <laughs> to know that you were paying attention and you were listening. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much for that. These are hugely complex uh, pieces of work. I think if I was, I'm retired now, but I think if I was talking to uh, teachers now and I was talking about virtual exchange, the first thing I would say is you're going to be very busy. And you can see that from, <laughs> The, uh, the amount of work that has been uh, shared with us here today. Mm -hmm. Maybe, uh, Teresa, I think uh, uh, it would be very interesting to, to have like uh, two symposiums on uh, within the uh, Europol conference. Um, in, this, in this context uh, uh, of the symposiums, uh, speakers will have uh, more, much more time, I think. I believe there is work submitted. I haven't started my reviewing yet, but I believe work has been submitted around CMC and uh, virtual exchange. And of course, we have a virtual exchange journal um, mm -hmm. through the uni collaboration uh, team as well. So, uh, yes, I hope you're aware of each other. And I'm, I know I know you are, I know the presenters are, but the, Amira, I, I wanted to mention as well that Uni Collaborate has a PhD and a, a postgraduate uh, SIG um, and they connect and support each other. So if you haven't yet found each other, I will tweet to you their, uh, their details because uh, it's always good. I know when you're, uh, when you're studying to have others who understand your context. Yeah, Thank true, you. But I finished my PhD by the way, Yay. two years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you. Well, congratulations. Thank you so much. So, um, Salvador, if we, if we don't have any other questions arising, then I think we'll switch the recording off now. Okay. Mm -hmm.